There's not too many Sundays that I can go home with the piano player, but I think I will today. <laughs> Amen. I'm not sure whether I should have said that being live streamed. Somebody will wake up in the middle of that and I'll be in trouble. Matthew chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. Matthew chapter 4, and we are going to um, be talking about the temptation of Jesus. And how we can go from temptation to triumph. While you're turning there, um, I want to remind you, um, just in case you're wondering, that I'm humbled, excited, and thankful to be your pastor. Um, many of you have said that to me that you're glad I'm your pastor, but I'm not sure I've said it enough to you. And um, sometimes you get so busy you just forget to say it. And I want you to know I do not take that for granted. Um, I wish I was a perfect pastor. Um, I wish I was a perfect husband and father. But I'm thankful that I serve the perfect one uh, that gives grace and it is at times that it is grace alone. And it is amazing grace. And um, I'm grateful to be here today. All of you know by now that one of my favorite 30 minute comedies is The Andy Griffith Show. I grew up watching Andy Griffith. Anybody else in here grow up watching Andy Griffith? Anybody in here an Andy Griffith? Like, fanatic? Anybody besides me? Yeah, I got one. I figured it'd be Keith. Uh, anybody else? Anybody watch it on a regular basis? Even, you might not be a fanatic, but you see it. One of my favorite episodes is when Barney gets the motorcycle. And um, he comes in with these big goggles on, and he's all excited, and He's expecting, you know, all the town, the men of the town have made fun of him, and he's expecting to get support from uh, Andy. And uh, Andy says, well, how are you doing, Baron Von Richthofen? And it just crushes Barney. Well, let me tell you a real story about the Baron. Manfred Von Richthofen was a famous German First World War fighter pilot. He was better known as the Red Baron because he flew a distinctive uh, red aircraft. He shot down more combat planes than anyone else on either side in the First World War. His known kill tally was 80. On the 21st of April of 1918, he began chasing a Canadian plane that was trying to escape the battle over uh, uh, in, in the area where they were, and as the Red Baron pursued his prey, he strayed behind Allied lines. He dove too low into the enemy lines, and he also missed a Canadian pilot, Arthur Roy Brown, coming up on his tail to help his comrade. We will never know whether it was a shot from the ground or a shot from Brown that killed the Baron. But what we do know is that the Red Baron came to his end because he made the mistake of pursuing that Allied plane too long, too far, and too low into enemy territory. And that was one report. As many committed Christians have been shot down because they have followed temptation for too long, too far, and too low in enemy territory. In fact, as with the barren, they are caught unaware and have to deal with the consequences. 
And in the passage today that we're going to read, we're going to examine the life of Jesus in the context of Him being tempted by Satan. How Jesus responded to the various temptations of Satan is vital to our understanding of how we can deal with the issue of our own temptations. It's also important to understand just what it means to be tempted. And there are two common understandings of the word tempt in the original Greek language. One is to persuade someone to do something wrong. That is the enticement of our flesh to do that which is wrong. The other is to test in the sense of trying someone to determine their nature or their character. It's also noteworthy to look at the circumstances of this time of the testing Jesus experienced. It followed a spiritual high. His baptism, His public approval of the Heavenly Father, and then the Spirit of God, uh, as it were, descending on Him like a dove. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, the Scripture says, Then Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Do not overlook don't underestimate, don't, don't count it as unimportant that Jesus was led to the place that He would be tempted by the Spirit of God. You don't have to understand it, you don't have to explain it, but you have to know it. He was led to the wilderness by the Spirit of God. And when He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, He was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leave, leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. The first thing I want you to understand today is the realities of temptation. The realities of temptation. First of all, the Spirit-led believer will be tempted. Do not believe because you are walking with the Lord and because you are in the Word and on your knees in prayer that you are, are not going to be tempted. Jesus was Spirit-filled. He was Spirit-led. And as He was being led to the wilderness, even Spirit-led Jesus, even Spirit-filled Jesus was tempted by the enemy. Spirit-filled Christians will be tempted, and so you must look out for it. Secondly, there is a spiritual world. You don't live in just a physical world. The Bible says, tells us very vividly that we do not fight flesh and blood. We fight a spiritual battle, the principalities and powers of the air. There is a spiritual world. It is real. It doesn't matter what the skeptics say. It doesn't matter what our... Um, uh, critics say they think sometimes we're sort of crazy because we talk about the supernatural world but the truth is there is a spiritual world it is real third we are tempted by a formidable enemy Satan he is formidable he is he is not just some he's not this little red man this little man that runs around in a red suit with with, a horn, with uh, horns on his head and a pitchfork in his hand and, and a long pointed tail. He is real. In fact, he was the covering cherub who was beautiful and was perfect in all of his being when he was created. And he still comes as an angel of light and will present something good to you knowing that it can be destructive. He's not an ugly creature. He's a beautiful angel. 
That's what the Bible described him as. And he still comes to us in, in ways and presents things beautiful to us that now can destroy if we're not careful. Number four, the stakes are high in this war. Eternal. For some, the battle with Satan and his forces will mean life or death eternally. For others, it will mean the gain of reward or the loss of reward. It can mean your reputation. It can mean your marriage. It can mean your children. It can mean all kinds of... The stakes are high, ladies and gentlemen, when we are dealing with the devil. It can mean your church. And then the scope of spiritual warfare is universal. No one is exempt. See, I, re I believe that because of Satan being created, there were limitations put on him. I do not believe Satan is an omnipresent being. I believe there's only one that's omnipresent, and that's God. But he, he and his forces, remember, he was not the only one cast out of heaven. A third of the angels were also cast out and, and, and are subservient to Satan, and they also do his bidding. And so we understand that the scope of spiritual warfare is universal. Evil is everywhere, and no one is exempt from temptation. And then our involvement in spiritual warfare is personal. He doesn't just tempt, and we are not just in a spiritual warfare with a group of people. It is also personal Satan many times, or his enemy, or our flesh, or the world makes it personal. We have to make personal decisions. We have to personally be engaged in spiritual warfare and, and have the right tools and the right uh, equipment and those things making sure that we have what is necessary to fight properly in this battle. There are all kinds of stories about Pearl Harbor. The attack took place on December the 7th, 1941, on a Sunday, uh, on a sunny sun, Sunday morning. And again, because there are so many stories, I sort of put them all together. So this is one, one uh, account. A minimal contingent of soldiers was on duty at the time, and most offices on the base were closed, and many servicemen were on leave for the weekend. New technology, including the new radar mounted on uh, Opana Point, was in place, including uh, or manned and functioning at the time of the attack. The incoming Japanese attack planes were detected by the radar and reported, but were mistaken for an incoming group of American planes due from the mainland that morning. While on practice maneuvers outside the harbor that morning, an American destroyer spotted a Japanese submarine attempting to sneak into the harbor. The submarine was fired upon, immediately reported, and ignored. That is from a war history site. Regardless, we know whether all the details are known, we know it was a sneak attack. We know that we were not prepared. And despite these and many other warnings, those warnings are known to be fact. There was suspicion, but some of those warnings were not taken seriously. The losses and ill preparedness came from one major cause. No one believed it could happen. Not to the United States. You see, we are in spiritual warfare. And sometimes we call it a bad day, or we blame it on mean people. But many times we are under heavy assault from the devil. And one of the worst things that you can say about your life is that will never happen to me. Some of you have said in your, in your life when somebody commits a sin, or, and especially when it's something that really carries heavy consequences, and let me tell you, this is where we hear it the most. When, somebody, when there is infidelity in a family or something, we hear Christians going away, going like this. Well, I can't believe they did that. I would never do that to my spouse. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't watch it, Satan will slap you right upside your head and you don't know what you would do if you're not on guard. Don't you ever say, I would never do that. 
That's dangerous. That's arrogant. So we see the realities of temptation. But then we see the schemes of Satan in temptation. Satan, first of all, when you look at Jesus and you see what he was going through in this 40-day fast, there are several things we learn from this. Why did Satan go then? He, he must have known that the Spirit led Jesus there. He knew who Jesus was because Jesus was his creator. So he wasn't tempting a stranger. So what were his schemes? Well, Satan tempts us using our natural needs. That is called self-gratification. You see, we are tempted to fulfill our desires apart from God's will. Let me ask something. Is it wrong to be hungry? No. But it's wrong to eat ourselves sick. Is it wrong to be thirsty? No, but it's wrong to put things in our body that alter our awareness and our brain cells. Is it wrong to want to be pain-free? No, but it's wrong to abuse medicines and substances that harm us. God created the sexual relationship, but the Bible says, hear me well, the Bible says that any kind of sexual relationship outside of the bonds of marriage is a sin. We have not changed on that. And it's the only acceptable relationship of that nature should be between a husband and a wife. Not two men, not two women, but a husband and a wife. Period. The end. And by the way, I'm not a homophobe, and I don't hate people that don't believe that. Don't you let the world dictate how we treat others because we stand for something. Just because you stand for truth does not mean you're a hater. And you ought to be willing to stand up and say that. But Satan uses our natural needs. Our natural need for affection. Our natural need for happiness and, and contentment. Our natural need for hunger and sleep. Uh, you know, we all need sleep, but we're not to be lazy. Satan got to Jesus when he was hungry. When he was alone. When he was tired. Satan will always... You need to remember the times. Think about Learn yourself. Think about the times that you are tempted the greatest. Examine what's going on in your life. Think about that and make sure you, you do things to combat that. If your greatest uh, temptation is at night when nobody's watching, go to bed. If your greatest temptation is when you're alone, don't be alone. If your greatest temptation is the computer that's in a closed up room where nobody else can see it, put it in the open and don't get on it unless somebody else is there. Put filters on it. I'll give you one that you guys will think are funny. It's not funny. That, well, sometimes it is, but... You know, I've probably... Gained the weight that I've gained in the last five years between the hours of nine at night and two in the morning. I could lose 30 pounds if I'd have just gone to bed. That's true. Because while I was doing my schoolwork, I had the, my hand on one part of the computer and my other hand in a bowl of something. Keep myself awake. I get all kinds of excuses. It's called discipline. By the way, I started to ask you, and I know this is live streaming. I'm really hoping nobody's watching right now. But they probably are. But you know, I, I thought about telling you guys, I'm, I'm really trying to do better. And the last time I really did well was when I asked the congregation that I was pastoring 
to pray for me as I was trying to get healthy. I told the congregation one Sunday morning, please pray that I will discipline myself to eat healthy and to lose weight. And 13 months later, I had lost 55 pounds. Every Sunday, they were saying, Preacher, we're praying for you. And, and on times that I wanted a big bowl of chocolate ice cream, I just wanted to go, don't pray today. <laughs> but pray for me. You know, the truth is, that's, that's one of my struggles. Jesus always, or Satan always tempts us at our, the need that we have, our natural God-given needs. That's, that may not have as many Immediate consequences, but even that one has consequences that we can avoid if we just say no. Jesus demonstrated how to trust the all-satisfying, all-sufficient goodness of God. Notice what He said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus was so disciplined and so tuned in with the Heavenly Father that He was able to say, Satan, bread may be important, but you cannot live that alone. He did not live to eat. He ate to live. But He knew that he had to have the relationship with his heavenly father. He knew his relationship, the word of God, was the all-satisfying, all-sufficient word, the goodness of God. And so he simply said, Satan, I don't need your bread. I don't need to turn these stones to bread. Because I don't live by that alone. He knew there was a time coming when he would be fed and nourished by the angels. And so he resisted. But then Satan also tempts us with our desire to be in control. That's called self-protection. See, we're tempted to question God's presence and manipulate his promises. Why? Because we want to be in control. We don't think God can work it out the way we want it. We don't think God can work it out to our best. And when we are in control, what we're saying is, God, I know better than you. I know how to fix this. I know what needs to be done. And we don't trust God because we want to be in control. The devil took him, verse 5, into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, cast yourself down. They'll bear you up so you won't dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. See, we're tempted to question God's presence. Jesus rested in the unshakable security of the Father. Do you really believe what you learned in Sunday school today? And for those of you that weren't here, we talked about God's grace being sufficient. Paul had to come to a place in his life where he knew that the thorn of the flesh was given to him and the, the messenger of Satan to buffet him. And he had to come to a place where he said, I'm going to glory in my infirmities because God has told me no three times to my request for that to be taken away from me. And he had to come to a point where he rested in the unshakable security, grace, and mercy of the Heavenly Father. See, Satan tempts us with our desire to be in control. He wants you to think that you have a better answer than God does. He wants you to handle it your way. He wants you to do it now. We, we don't like to wait, right? So we get ourselves in trouble many times because instead of waiting on God's perfect plan, we go with our imperfect plan, and then we ask God to bless that. And if we had awaited, God was already going to bless His plan, but we're, patient because, we're impatient because we want to be in control. By the way, if you don't think that people want to be in control, when you get home today, just set the remote control down somewhere in the living room and see who goes for it. That's a really funny, simple illustration. You know, but you think even something like that, we want to be in control. You know, I, I know people that their spouse cannot drive them anywhere. They have to drive. It's okay. I'm not saying that's a sin, 
But that is control. You know, they, they feel out of control if their hands are not on the wheel. And as much as we've traveled over the years, I am so thankful that my wife and, and, and I do not have that issue. We really don't. I mean, I, can, I sleep like a baby when she's driving. I'm not sure she does, but I, she has. But we don't have that control. But there are people, I know people, you know, I drive everywhere. And that's not always just the men. I mean, I, I know ladies that their husband's not going to drive them anywhere. They go on vacation, the women are going to drive. I mean, I know that. It, it's both ways. But think about it. Satan tempts us with our desire to self-protect. It's the reason we won't confess our faults one to another. It's the reason that two of the hardest words in the English language that, that the church will not say is, I'm sorry. Because when you say, I'm sorry, you're humbling yourself and you're out of, you, you have to give up some control. How many times have you and your spouse stayed at odds way too long because nobody in the relationship would say, I'm sorry? It would be funny if it wasn't so ridiculous and harmful. But Jesus taught us in his life to rest in the unshakable security of the Father. The Father's not going to do anything to harm you. The Heavenly Father's not going to do anything to hurt you. Oh, it may be painful. And it may be hard at times to go through his plan. Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. But I promise you, his plan is always good for you. You've got to trust in his unshakable security. And then Satan tempts us with our desire for power and glory, self-exaltation. In fact, that's what Satan, and Satan said, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Or no, I'm sorry. And again, the devil taketh him into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Isn't that funny? That's funny to me that Satan would say that. And yet Jesus could have been a smart aleck. He could have used sarcasm. He could have said, you don't have to give me anything because I created all that you're saying you give me. That's what he could have said. But he didn't. He taught us something. He knew he owned it all. He knew he created it all. So he set an example for us. And this is what he said. Get away from me, Satan. Get away. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He didn't stoop to Satan. He didn't get into a crazy argument with Satan. Christ knew who he was. He wants us to know who we are. We just say, Satan, get behind me. That's not the direction I'm going. I am to worship one. I'm not going to exalt myself. I'm going to exalt the one that I worship. We are tempted to assert ourselves in the world while robbing God of His rightly place of being the only object of our worship. He is to be the only object of our worship. We're not to assert ourselves above Him. That's what Satan did. That was the, the first war in heaven. Satan wanted to rise above and be God. And, and God said, no, that don't work. I created you. Satan wasn't he, he wanted to he wanted to exalt himself and therefore God cast him out and and when sin was passed down by Adam to all men one of the problems is self exaltation I did this and I did that and I listen ladies and gentlemen do you understand this morning that you and I are absolutely worthless and nothing apart from Jesus Christ there is no good thing in us. It's the opposite of what the world teaches. The world teaches you that you are so good and everything that's bad is because you had bad parents or you had a bad job. Everybody that has problems in the world, it's always somebody else's fault. That is a form of self-exaltation. And Satan uses our desire for power and glory to tempt us. Jesus did not, listen, listen to this, I love this. Jesus did not exchange the end time exaltation by the Father for a right now 
exaltation of a snake. Jesus did not exchange the end time exaltation by the Heavenly Father for a right now exaltation of a snake. You remember what Jesus told the Pharisees? They do all of this, and, and, and even the disciples. He said, you do all of this, and, and, and you get your pat on the back, and, and your reward. And he said, you have your reward. That's it. Self-exaltation just simply robs us of what God the Father wants to do for us in the end. You can have it now, or you can have it for eternity. It's your choice. You can, you can have the paddle. Now, now, don't misunderstand. We are to encourage one another. We are to build one another up in our faith. We, we don't trade one for the other. We, we do both. We stay humble. We depend on God for humility and, and the proper self-evaluation while we're building one another up and encouraging one another with with good, encouraging words that build up, in our, build up people in their faith. But we give God His rightful place and we do not rob Him of His glory. He is the only one that is to be exalted. And don't exchange what God wants to do for you when you stand before Him for the self-gratification and the self-exaltation that an old snake, an old serpent, an old deceiver will give you right now. It's not worth it. So, what do we learn from Jesus' dealing? The lessons we learn. There's a bunch of them, but I'm not going to preach them. I'm just going to list them. Remember this. Some of the greatest temptations can come after our greatest spiritual victories. God will design some of our greatest times of testing when we are alone. When we are tempted, our resolve to do the will of God will be tested. Listen to this one. Satan will lie to you. Satan will lie to you. Satan is powerful, but not more powerful than God or the Holy Spirit working in us. Remember, the Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. There is more to life than food. Lean times are times of learning and spiritual growth. You think 40 days and 40 nights fasting was lean times? It was lean on sleep. It was lean on food. Lean on strength. But Jesus changed the world after that time with the Father. God is with us even when it seems as though He's not. Our soul is of eternal worth. The world is temporal. God tests us Satan tempts us. Satan tempts us at our place of worship. You think you can come in to this, what we've turned into a sanctuary on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and over there on Wednesday night, you think you can come in here and think Satan is just going to leave you alone because you're sitting in church? you got your head buried in the sand. In fact, he would like to tear you up right here more than any other place you are. He'd like to disrupt your worship. He would like to disrupt our fellowship. He would like to do anything he can. He's not going to leave us alone just because we come to church. Testing and tempting sometimes come when we are physically weak. Here's another one that I want you to pay attention to, maybe more than others. Satan plays to win, not by the rules. And because Jesus defeated Satan, so can we. He said, you can overcome the world because I've overcome the world. You know, we need to know about Satan, but we don't need to glorify Satan. We need to glorify God. He's much stronger. Amen. 
That don't sound like you believe that, but amen. And then Scripture answers Satan. That's the reason it's so important. Everything Jesus said to Satan was Scripture. Everything. So that's the, those are some of the lessons we learn. But then what are the keys to resisting him? What did Jesus teach us about resisting Satan in this story? Well, number one, extended time with the Heavenly Father will always help. He was with the Father for 40 days. Extended time with the Heavenly Father always helps. Listen, don't think you can get up in the morning, say, thank you, Jesus, for another day, read one verse, go out and conquer the world. That's not going to happen. In fact, you remember at the Mount of Transfiguration, they came down off the mountain, and some of the disciples who were not up there said, we tried to cast the demon out of this little boy, and we couldn't do it. And Jesus said, there's some things that can only happen through prayer and fasting. They hadn't spent time with the Father. They hadn't spent time in prayer. And, and we think we can go and tackle a day when we don't spend time with the Father. If you're too busy to spend time with God in the Word and in prayer, you are too busy. Amen. You can amen even if you're not doing it. Just agree with it. You're too busy if you can't spend time with God. If we ever build permanent seats in a place like this, I'm going to put a button on here that I can shock you underneath. <laughs> Just having a little fun. Extended time with the Heavenly Father. And then patient and faithful obedience to God's will. He was just, Jesus was just consistent. He was just faithful and patient. You know, think about this. He engaged Satan in a conversation. He wasn't toying around with him. He was simply answering that. You know, I'm not so sure that sometimes we ought not say, Now, Satan, you know I believe this. So you might as well just move on down the road. So many times we just try to tackle it our own way. Just talk to him. Say, Satan, no, I'm not going to think that. I'm not going to do that. You're not going to win in this. T speak it out loud. Tell him, I, you are not getting a hold of me today. Quote the scripture to him. Tell him, hey, Satan, the one that lives in me created you. So get out of here. You have no room, you, you don't have a place here of residency. No vacancy in my life. <clears throat> and then accurate and confident use of God's Word. You know, one of my pet peeves, I'll admit it. One of my pet peeves is for people to misuse the Scripture. And sometimes I have to be patient. Because sometimes they misuse it because they're really trying to understand it and they just hadn't learned it yet. And just like me, I have not learned everything about the Scripture. So I have to learn and keep learning and keep learning and keep learning. But especially when people know, like, my uncle was bad. Now, he's, he's in heaven today, so if he's watching, I mean, he, he won't get mad because he's in heaven. But he'd say, he'd say crazy stuff, like, the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. You know, you can't find that in the Bible. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. You won't find it in any translation. The only translation you'll find that in is your own translation. Here's another one. Cleanliness is next to godliness. That is nowhere in the Bible. I've heard people say that. You know, the Bible says cleanliness is next to godliness. That's crazy. Jesus accurately and consistently used the Word of God. Everything he did, everything he said, it was accurate, consistent. He knew how to answer Satan. And the best answer that we have for Satan is God's Word. Always. Always. And then consistently resisting temptation. Keep saying no. You remember, just say no? Remember that slogan? Just say no. That's a good slogan for the Christian. Sometimes you just need to say no. Ready? Say it with me. One, two, three. No. Now spell it with me. N-O. No. One more time. N-O. No. That's a good word to learn as a Christian. 
Not we'll see. Maybe. No. You want to steal. You want to cheat. You want to say that nasty word because you're mad at somebody. No. Just say no. I know it's harder than that. But it's a place to start. Just keep resisting. Just keep resisting. Satan's going to keep throwing it out there. You just keep saying no. You know, there were some things that my mom and dad, I, I'm not sure that a gun to their head would have changed their answer from no to yes. Yes. There were some things that were just no. And my dad's phrase was, don't you ask again. And I'm not so sure that that's not what I'll tell Satan. Now, he's going to ask again because he don't obey us. He'll, you know, he has to obey the Lord. And he will resist us if we, you know, flee from him. But sometimes we ought to just say, Satan, stop. I'm not going there. Just get away from me. And, and you know, the Bible says eventually he'll flee from you. Now, he may come back, but you keep saying no. And then we need to depend on the physical and spiritual renewal received by God. I probably need to practice this as I preach it. But I'm going to tell you something. When we are tired, we are weak. When we're tired, we're weak. Whether you like it or not, you need rest. You need food. You need recreation. You need time alone. You need time to nurture your life with the Word and prayer. But you need rest. Listen, you may can go, and I've lived this life a lot of times in my life, you may can go on a few hours of sleep, but sooner or later, Satan is going to throw something out there when you're tired and worn down, and he's going to try to put you in a snare. The more rested physically and spiritually that you are, the more capability you have to resist the devil. That's why he came to Jesus when he was tired and hungry and probably worn out. But what did Jesus depend on? All of those peripheral circumstances? No, he depended on the Word of God. He depended on the Scripture three times. He depended on the physical and spiritual renewal that he received from his Heavenly Father. Let me tell you a story in conclusion. There's an old story of an eagle who on an early morning during the spring thaw soared high above the forest looking for something to eat. As he followed the course of a river, he looked down and spied a small rodent trapped on a piece of ice that had broken free and was floating down the stream. Seeing an easy meal, he swooped down, landed on the ice, killed the mouse, and began to eat. He continued his meal, and he saw that his perch was rapidly approaching a waterfall, but determined to finish eating and thinking he would rise into the air and to safety at the last moment, he continued his course. As the ice neared the falls, the eagle finished his last bite, and satisfied with his breakfast, he spread his mighty wings and attempted to rise skyward as the chunk of ice tipped over the edge. And while enjoying his meal, however, he had failed to notice that the warmth of his feet had caused his claws to become embedded in the ice. He could not dislodge them and free himself from what now had become the burden that, he would, that would carry him to his death on the rocks far below. 
don't fool yourself this morning and don't be overconfident thinking that it can never happen to you because that's a recipe for disaster. Given the right circumstances, any of us are capable of messing up. C.S. Lewis made these insightful observations about temptation. He said, no man knows how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. That is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. He's the only one. We do not have a high priest who has not been touched with our infirmities, but in every way was tempted like we are, yet without sin. He's the only one that knows the full extent of temptation. We do not know that. That's why we have to depend on him to resist it. That was how Jesus started off right after his baptism. Right after that spiritual high. Listen, we, you know, some of the, as a pastor, some of the worst days of my life have been right after a great Sunday. <laughs> you go home and you've baptized people and people come to the altar and get saved and you think you're riding high and the wave crashes on Monday. And you're not prepared for it. Listen, we don't have to run scared. Don't leave this morning thinking, and I'm trying to say, you've got to run scared. You don't. Remember who lives in you. Remember who you serve. But don't be caught off guard. We serve Jesus. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We serve the one who created the perfect Lucifer. He didn't create him the way he is now. That was Lucifer's choice. But he will give you strength to rise above the temptation, to say no, to resist the devil. You have to make the decision to do it. Let's bow for prayer. I, I do believe sometimes that we think that if we're not tempted to commit one of the sins of disobeying the Ten Commandments, that we're okay. But what about that temptation to criticize or to gossip or to hold malice or to be angry or envy or the temptation of pride, the sins of the spirit, not just the sins of the flesh? What is it today that Satan just comes at you? He knows your weakness. He knows where it's hard for you to resist. Listen, don't be ashamed of that. Embrace it and, and do what you've been instructed to do. There's nothing... You don't have to be ashamed because you're tempted and you battle spiritual warfare. You don't need to be. It's okay. But don't continue to put yourself in that position when you know there's an answer. So I wonder today if you need to just come and say, Lord, here's what I'm struggling with. First of all, tell him. He already knows, but it's good for you to tell him. Tell him, Lord, I'm struggling with my attitude. Lord, I'm struggling in my relationships. Lord, I'm tempted to just quit. I'm tempted to whatever. You fill in the blanks. We're going to sing in just a moment. And if you need to come to deal with the Lord about anything, I want you to come. I want us to stand together with our heads bowed, eyes closed. I appreciate your attention today more than you'll ever know. Embrace God's grace today. He's not, he's not angry with you. He, he, he wants you to, He wants to embrace you and help you. Lord, I pray that you will give confidence and boldness to anyone that may need to come and just openly 
pray and seek your face and ask for help. Lord, I, I know we can do that anywhere. For that, we're grateful. I pray that if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, that today would be the day that they would embrace you and know that you love them and that you have overcome sin and you can help them and take away their sins. Help them with their temptation. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your strength. In Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed.